Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Fuller, and I'm the Chief Sponsorship and Mission Integration Officer here at St. Joseph's College of Maine. And this is our fourth evening of conversations around the critical concern of anti-racism, one of the five critical concerns of the Sisters of Mercy. And tonight, our conversation is a panel discussion. <clears throat> so we'll have three faculty members at St. Joseph's who will be presenting uh, from within their different fields. And then we'll have a conversation after that. So as they present, if you are watching either through the Google Meet or live stream and you'd like to ask a question, you can send your questions in to me by email at vpmission at sjcme.edu, which you should see there on your screen. Or you can join the conversation if you're with us here on Google Meet. So we have three faculty members with us, as I said. And oops, that's don't want to do that. We uh, stop the screen here. There we go. We have three faculty members who are part of our panel this evening on the intersection of race and academic disciplines. Our first presenter will be Josh Schoenfeld, who is a licensed clinical psychologist, a passionate teacher with broad interests in research and practice. The scholarly interests range from basic relationship science to the role of psychology in the socio-political arena. He maintains a private practice in Portland treating clients with a variety of psychological disorders. Our second presenter will be Caitlin Eldridge, who is director of the social work program and assistant professor of social work at St. Joseph's. She teaches introduction to social work and social policy courses. Her areas of focus are healthcare policy development, nonprofit management, and HIV AIDS related issues. And finally, our third presenter will be Dale Brooker. Dale's teaching and subsequent research started in an unusual place, a Texas prison. Early on, he taught sociology courses to students who happened to be incarcerated in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. His experiences there have shaped his subsequent teaching style and his research focus on corrections, prisons, and the reentry process. So, Josh, we will start with you. So, uh, Josh will begin by presenting on the field of psychology and its intersection with race. Great, thanks. Thanks very much um, to everybody for coming. I just have a few, um, we were asked to give a few sort of short comments up front so that we'd have a lot of time for discussion. And my job is to kind of talk a little bit about the framework for how we understand the mental machinery um, that underlies racism um, at the individual level, which is what psychology is all about, of course. So what I'll do very briefly is just give first a couple of definitions from a psychological perspective. You'll probably be familiar with these, but it's good to have them out there. And then I'll say a few things about three sources of prejudice and racism that we think about um, from when we look at these things through a psychological lens. So first, the, the working definition of racism that, that we usually use in psychology has two pieces. Um, one is an individual's prejudicial attitudes and discriminatory behavior towards people of a given race. And I say race because we're really, we're one human race, but that's the word that's being used. Um, or institutional practices that subordinate people of a given race, even if those are not motivated by prejudice. So racism from a psychological perspective is, is fairly complex. Now, I mentioned prejudice, and I have to explain um, quickly what prejudice is from a psychological perspective. Prejudice essentially is an attitude. And so in psychology, when we talk about attitudes, what we're talking about are um, preconceived judgments. They're evaluative stances towards things. And they could be positive, um, but usually in the context of prejudice, we talk about, we're talking about negative attitudes. Um, and we're talking about preconceived negative judgments of a group and its individual members. Now, it's important to remember that prejudice can be either implicit or explicit. So it can be either part of your conscious awareness or outside of your conscious awareness. And we know um, it's been very clearly demonstrated that people can have what we call implicit prejudices and implicit biases. That doesn't mean that you're a bad person or anything like that. It just means that that's kind of how your brain is wired. And so we need to understand that. 
Now, so if prejudice is a negative evaluation or a negative judgment, it's, a, it's an attitude. Usually they're supported by stereotypes, okay? Stereotypes are beliefs. They're not attitudes, they're beliefs. And they're beliefs about the personal attributes of a group of people. They're essentially generalizations. Now these truly can be positive, negative, neutral. The word stereotype doesn't contain within it, baked in, any kind of evaluation. So when you have a belief about a group of people, you can have that in a sort of generic way without having the evaluative stance towards that group of people. It's just the stereotype itself just refers to the belief. So if you believe all people from a certain place tend to be a certain way, that's just a stereotype that you have. Some stereotypes can even be benevolent and they can sort of masquerade as, as things that sound nice. So people often talk about, you know, benevolent sexism, for example, you know, men who think that, well, or women who think that all women are, you know, so wonderful because they're so, you know, they're so loving and maternal and all that kind of stuff. That's a stereotype, but it's, it sounds benevolent. So we call it benevolent stereotype. And then finally discrimination, which is just, it adds the behavioral component. So it's unjustified negative behavior can be by an individual, can be by an institution, that doesn't matter. Discrimination is the behavioral piece. Often it's rooted in prejudicial attitudes, but not always. There can be discrimination, including racism, sexism, etc., without intent, without prejudicial intent. There can still be racist discrimination. So, that's some, so those are just some definitions to get on the table. But really what I want to mention quickly are three sources of prejudice. Um, and I'll say prejudice probably more than I'll say racism just because racism is built into this world. And it's important to remember that prejudice is kind of the framework that, that holds these, these, um, these notions for us. So number one, I'll talk about social sources of prejudice. So sometimes our prejudice, our racism, comes from social places, things that have to do with the world around us, the social world around us, as we perceive it. Secondly, there are what we call motivational sources, okay? Things that have to do with the way that we generate our goal-directed behaviors, and it has to do with the things that we want and seek in this world and in this life. So some sources of prejudice come from that domain of human functioning. And then finally, thirdly, there are cognitive sources of prejudice. Sometimes our prejudice comes from the way that our brains think in a cognitive way, the way that we process information. So social, motivational, and cognitive sources. They're all um, kind of playing off each other in a soup. I mean, we're pretty complicated. And what we have is a whole lot of elements to this puzzle. The way they all fit together is is complicated and we don't have a full theory of that yet, but we know a lot of the pieces. So very quickly, on the social side, right, some of the social sources of prejudice have to do with, number one, social inequalities tend to breed prejudice. When you have a situation where there's a lot of unequal status, um, that tends to lead people down the road towards things like explaining it and justifying it in ways that have to do with evaluations of people. So that works from outside in. We perceive the world around us, we see unequal status, and that steers our thinking and our perception in a particular direction. An interesting finding is that we tend to see other groups of people as either competent or likable, but usually not both, right? So, we tend to, for example, there will be, you know, there are stereotypes. There's, a, there's, I think it was a joke that I read somewhere about, you know, Germans like Italians, but they don't respect them. And Italians respect Germans, but they don't like them. You know, this kind of thing where we tend to pick whether we're going to respect someone or like someone. And it's often not both. We look at groups of people. And usually it's up or down, depending on, on which one it is. Some people tend to be high in what we call social dominance orientation. They tend to view the people in the world in terms of hierarchies. And that's an individual difference variable. Some people do that more than others. Um, but that's also part of the social world that we live in. 
Secondly, within this social arena, there are processes that have to do with socialization, essentially learning. So, for example, sometimes people grow up and sort of develop through various reasons what we call an authoritarian personality. And that often is not inherent. Those aspects of the personality often are absorbed from social forces, be it um, family forces or other social things. And the authoritarian personality essentially has a strong focus on obedience um, and intolerance for weakness. And oftentimes these people were harshly disciplined as children, not all the time, of course, but, but that, that's a correlation that was found. Um, I'll jump to motivational sources. Sometimes our prejudice comes from our motivational system. So as human beings, we have systems that are designed to activate us in pursuit of goals, things that we need and things that we want in life. Um, when we are frustrated, in pursuit of a goal, then we tend to look for scapegoats. So frustration usually fuels hostility. And is a, a scapegoat theory is fairly well known. When people are frustrated from attaining things that they want and they feel they deserve, they often look to blame someone. That's just a part of, of human nature. So that is something that happens inside our motivational systems. Another motivational factor here is what we call social identity theory. We tend to define ourselves based on the groups that we're a part of, and the motivation here is to feel superior. Everybody wants to feel good, and oftentimes what we want to do is feel superior to others. I'm not saying that's good or bad, but that seems to be a human motivation, is to feel superior to other people. And so we define ourselves by these groups, and we develop what's called in-group bias. It's one of the easiest, most automatic human traits is to, when you perceive that you're part of a social group, you start to favor the members of that group. Even if it's a random group of people that's been assigned to you for very trivial reasons, your basic human nature is to start to act in such a way that favors this group over out groups. Um, and that supports positive self-concept, it feeds favoritism, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a need, a motivational need for status and for belonging, and that can obviously fuel prejudice as well. And I had a one funny image that I wanted to put up. We, the point of this was not to have a lot of pictures, but I will share one thing just to, this is one of my favorite pictures that I always think of, but I'm trying to remember the importance of identity and how important it is to us. So can everybody see this page that I shared? Somebody give me a yes, yes so I know. Okay, yeah. thank you. So what you see here is um, an Ohio State sports fan. So here on, so someone died, and the person who died is in the casket lying here where, I'm, where my arrow is moving up and down. And these people are spelling out O-H-I-O -O for Ohio State. So they're Ohio State sports fans. And apparently this person's last dying wish, or at least they feel they're honoring this person or something like that, by standing there jubilantly and doing the Ohio State sign um, with their dearly deceased um, relative lying there in the casket. And, you know, it's funny, but it also says a lot about, um, you know, the human spirit, I think. I'm going to stop sharing that. And it always reminds me of how, how important we, um, we take these identities. Because, you know, those people, if they'd been born 30 miles to the west, they would have been Michigan fans. And they would have been doing a different, you know, whatever Michigan, I have no idea. Maybe someone here knows what Michigan fans do. I don't know what Michigan fans do. So it's, it's kind of arbitrary. But the groups that we fall into, we tend to buy into very strongly. And we're very motivated to maintain that, that um, feeling of superiority and, and belonging. And then finally, cognitive sources of prejudice from the way that we think. Uh, many of you have heard a lot of these things before, but one of the basic characteristics of the way we process information is that we tend to categorize things very, very automatically. It's one of the ways that, um, that, that our brain evolved to help us go around the world. You can't um, take everything on a case-by-case -case basis. You have to do some categorization. 
And most of the time our categorizations work just fine. The problem is that we tend to do it when we sometimes should. So we do it for all kinds of things. We tend to do it a lot for people because people were very salient features of our environment um, over a long time. And so we've developed this automatic um, feature where we categorize people very spontaneously and very quickly. And, um, and those categorizations affect the way that we think. We also, another cognitive factor is that we notice distinctiveness. Things that stand out call our attention, whether it's a feature of the environment or a person or whatever. So we perceive people who stand out, we perceive distinctive people, we notice them, we pay attention to them, we notice vivid cases of things, and we draw conclusions from that. So that shifts our focus onto what we perceive to be the other. So if we're in a group or we're the majority, the person who's in the minority stands out and in a cognitive information processing way, we latch on to them and that gets us going. I had a few more little things I could say, but I don't want to take up too much time. And so just the three things if, um, that, I'll, that you guys can ask about just to stay oriented are the three sources of prejudice and racism, social, motivational, and cognitive. And um, I'll turn it over to um, Dr. Elbert. I will unmute like the now professional virtual educator that I am. Hi everybody, thanks Josh and thanks Chris and thanks Dale and everybody for being here. And um, I think that this is such an important conversation to be having and I really appreciate the efforts that everybody sort of went to to create this conversation throughout Mercy Week because um, boy is it relevant. So, um, I'm going to try to build on some of what Josh said and then um, kind of add some social work details in there. Um, social work and psychology are different fields, um, but in many ways, I think they're um, similar. One of the big things that I wanted to sort of communicate today is that social work is a value based field and it's a value-based profession. And so the sort of core values that define us are set forth by the National Association of Social Workers. Um, and those are service, social justice, competence, integrity, dignity and worth of the person, and last but not least, importance of human relationships. Um, so I'm going to come back to that last one a lot because it's my favorite and I think it's really um, relevant to our discussion here today. But I also kind of offer that comment on our values because social work and um, academia don't haven't always had a great relationship with each other because a lot of social work um, in the early days was based on you know, action, just doing what needed to be done in the moment to respond to uh, a social problem. And over time, it's it's become more of a science, there's been more research behind it, and it's sort of merged into an academic discipline. So when we're um, teaching social work, as some of you who are social work students in this conversation will be able to relate to, we have a very distinct set of principles and skills and ideas that we talk about in class. And then we send students out into the field to do their internship, um, which is essentially designed to knock all of that other stuff, um, hell west and crooked, as my grandmother used to say, and to sort of offer a new perspective of applying what we learn in the classroom to actual human interactions um, in the community in field placements and internships. So. Um, that's just to say that we can talk the talk really well in social work and the key is to be able to walk the walk as well. So we have that sort of academic lens and the sort of applied lens and they work together. Sometimes um, there's tension there as well. So one of the things that Josh said that really stuck out to me was this idea of sort of these prejudices that we have 
are sometimes within our consciousness, like we're aware of them, and other times we're, we don't, we're not aware. And one of the sort of fundamental pieces of social work that has to do with our practice and our effectiveness in the world is our ability to self-reflect and to say to ourselves, hmm, I'm having a feeling about this person. Where does that feeling come from? I wonder why I think this. And what am I going to do about it? And that is um, a really tough piece of our practice that um, is why we call it social work practice, right? Because we have to practice it all the time over the course of career, um, a lifetime. We have to practice reflecting and sort of looking at ourselves in the mirror and saying, where did I get this belief? Why do I feel this way about working with this person or this group of people? Um, why, do, why am I holding this judgment? So again, um, something that Josh said, it's not necessarily um, an issue of you're a good person or a bad one. We all have implicit bias and implicit sort of judgments that we make. And it's our job as social workers to stay aware of that and to examine those things. So you all have been, I'm sure, aware of the just wild and crazy world that we're living in. Um, you know, the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and many others. You know, there's a lot going on in sort of the cultural dialogue right now about um, racism and structural sort of institutionalized racism and what can we do to sort of undo it. And there's so much um, tension and friction between parties and groups and one of the things that social workers are um, adept at and, and continue to, to work on is kind of creating points of connectedness and really drilling down to focus on those human relationships. As a core value of our profession, we're compelled to sort of seek out the conversations that need to be had, to build the relationships that are trusting and supportive to facilitate those conversations. And that's a really tough um, thing to do, particularly when those conversations are uncomfortable for us or we feel like, hey, I'm just here to make the world a better place. Don't be mad at me. Um, we really have to do more than that. We have to really investigate our role in perpetuating these systems and structures that, are, that oppress people and see what we can do to help sort of dismantle them. And I do think that building those relationships is fundamental to the work of, of anti-racist social work practice, because we have to be able to engage with people who don't think the same as us. And we have to be able to have dialogue that is hard and constructive. And then the key is that once we have that dialogue, we need to act. So social work has a long history of, of action as well as academic study. And you know we've seen social workers on the sort of front lines of protests and community organizing and really bringing communities together to address these issues and, and sort of speak truth to power such as it is. So we have to kind of continue this process of self-examination and self-awareness and also apply it to the systems that we're part of. Um, we want to make sure that we don't fall asleep at the switch. We have to stay alert and focused on identifying the privilege that we have, our biases that we hold, why we think what we think, and we have to keep ourselves in check as we continue to build these relationships with people around us, particularly those who think differently, and then work together to make some really effective change. So. Um, I think I will leave it at that and pass it on to Dr. Brooker because I know he has a lot of great um, comments to offer as well, but I just kind of wanted to put it out there that for those of you who may be um, reluctant to, to sort of talk about these hard things or to engage with people who you know are different in a different sort of philosophical camp than you are, um, a challenge to you is to um, try, at least try to sort of broach these topics and see um, 
see where it gets you because you might be surprised by, by what you find and people's willingness to engage. And also a reminder, don't forget to vote because it's very important. So um, over to you, Dr. Brooker, and thank you all so much. Thanks, Caitlin. <clears throat> Thanks, Caitlin. Um, you know, I think one of the things that you highlight is to have those conversations with people about difficult um, issues. And tonight I'll, I'll be talking about some of those difficult issues that uh, I've grappled with as, as a criminologist, as a sociologist uh, over the last 20 years. And we had hard conversations, as, as Dr. Fuller had mentioned at the, at the top of the um, at the top of the discussion tonight that my, you know, my, my background is, is that I started teaching in a college setting, but it was in a prison. And it, you have those hard conversations when you're dealing with people who uh, have been marginalized and um, have been um, put into a system that is, is flawed at best. And that's the criminal justice system here in the United States. Uh, it's not a perfect system. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a challenged system. Uh, it has been an overtly racist and discriminatory system in years past. Uh, on all of the events that we we're talking about right now, and those conversations continue. Uh, and, and it's important to have those conversations, whether you're talking to inmates uh, who are trying to get a college education and uh, do something to, you know, to to move ahead and uh, to get out into the world and, and do something positive, or it's uh, your traditional on-campus uh, students, your traditional 18 to 21 year olds who want to go into a system that might seem flawed, uh, that might seem difficult to navigate, right? Uh, you know, there are big questions about who wants to become a, a police officer in the 21st century. There's still a lot of people that want to become police officers, but what does that police officer look like in the 21st century? How, how does that differ from uh, law enforcement officers from the 1980s, 1990s, et cetera? Uh, what, is, what role does social work play in that? Uh, why do we at St. Joseph College require a social work class of every single criminal justice major? Uh, what, do, what role does psychology play in all of that? Uh, and, and the bottom line is, is that this interdisciplinary approach to understanding crime and justice uh, is one that we, you know, take great pride in and one that allows people to think critically about the system and what role they're eventually going to play in that system. Uh, I think a number of years ago uh, in one of the magazines, Oliver, you can go and look this up when you get a chance. Um, you know, I think one of the articles that was, you know, written was, you know, you know, we're not a cop shop and, and St. Joseph's College certainly is not that. We we're trying to get students to think critically about law enforcement and what their role might be and what their role might be in the correctional system, what their role might be as a lawyer, uh, what their role might be as a probation officer, what their role might be uh, as, a, you know, uh, as, as a juvenile um, probation officer. What does that look like? That's what we're trying to do. And we navigate that micro level elements of how people's brains are wired, as Dr. Schoenfeld had noted. Uh, we also navigate what systems look like, as you know, as as uh, Professor Eldridge has highlighted here. But the bottom line is, is that the criminal justice system, ha as as an institution, and this is something that you noted as well, Dr. Schoenfeld, is the fact that there are institutional practices that take place at the macro level uh, within a system that are, have been inherently biased uh, over time, and they have a long-standing tradition. Uh, there are two. There are two things that I want to bring to your attention in terms of uh, maybe informing yourself a little bit more about the criminal justice system as it relates to race um, and some both overtly and covertly discriminatory practices that have been around. Number one is the film uh, the Thirteenth, uh, re re referencing the Thirteenth Amendment, uh, <clears throat> and that film can be. Is, can be viewed on Netflix. Uh, I just went and revisited it the other day. It's, it's a great film. In addition to that, uh, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow um, is, is another critical piece to examine uh, criminal justice issues with regards to using a, a race lens um, and, and understanding that. And it's Michelle Alexander's piece that I'll kind of highlight here. And, and Michelle Alexander has really two premises, and that is 
historically speaking, African American men have been targeted as criminals. They've been identified as criminals um, from you know post Civil War era black codes. Uh, all the way through the war on drugs, and even in today's current climate, they're still identified as as criminals in many ways. Secondly, Alexander highlights the fact that the criminal justice system operates as a mechanism of, you know, as a mechanism of racial control uh, to control how races are processed through the system. And with that, I'm, I'm going to talk about three different types of. Uh, practices that are that are taking place are three different types of issues that are taking place currently. Uh, one of that is use of force. And there's a continuum of force that's used by law enforcement officials. Um, there's non-lethal use of force, you know, um, you know, slowly trying to get somebody to cooperate and, you know, talk them down and, um, you know, put them in handcuffs if necessary, depending upon the situation, all the way to deadly force, which unfortunately we've become all too familiar with. Uh, especially in this last decade alone, but that has a long, long history uh, in in the U.S. Um, in terms of use of force. So we'll talk a little bit about the disproportionate use of force by police against minorities. Talk a little bit about the impact of mass incarceration on minorities. Uh, and we'll talk about racial discrimination with regards to the U.S. death penalty. And I'll, I'll throw out some statistics. And I'll throw out some research that's been done so we can have some talking points afterwards and have some conversation. Uh, <clears throat> number one, here's an interesting fact. Black people, African-Americans, are three times more likely to actually be killed by the police than white people. Three times more likely to be killed by the police. Black people killed by police were 1.3 times more likely to be actually unarmed than white people. Uh, that were killed by police, okay? Also, black people have been, um, constitute 28% of those killed by police, even though they only make up 13% of the population in the United States. So that's where that disproportionality comes from that we talk about a lot in our um, discussions that needs to be highlighted time and time again when one group is disproportionately treated uh, in a way or certain actions are taken against these uh, groups of people, okay? Data from California shows that police stopped and used force against black people disproportionately compared to other racial groups. In addition to that, uh, Mark Hochstra, an economist at Texas a and I'm down in Texas right now, that's why you see the brick wall behind me. Um, lots of brick down here in Texas, but um, down here in Texas, at Texas a Texas A&M University, uh, in College Station, um, the economist Mark Hochstra um, attempted to decipher the role uh, in police officers' use of force by comparing responses to emergency calls. So, when you get a 911 call, um, what happens? Somebody gets dispatched. And but based upon that information of more than two million 911 calls in two United States cities, he concluded that white officers dispatched to predominantly black neighborhoods fired their guns five times as often as black officers dispatched for similar calls to the same neighborhoods. What they're suggesting is that white officers are more likely to use their firearms in these black neighborhoods um, than African-American officers in the same neighborhoods. So that gives you a kind of a perspective on the use of force. Now, <clears throat> let me be very careful about this information that I'm sharing with you. This does not mean that every single police officer, including my own wife, um, is racist. Um, it doesn't mean that every single officer that's graduated from St. Joseph's College and gone on to have really well um, developed careers in law enforcement are racist. Uh, what it means is that these are social facts that we've examined and researched over time that have a variety of different factors, some of which Dr. Schoenfeld mentioned, and some of which Professor Eldridge had mentioned that come and connect to create an environment where these particular social events take place. And we have to understand them based upon the social historical context in which the criminal justice system has evolved um, from a uh, system, especially in the late 19th century into today, where, uh, again, as Alexander points out, you know, it's a mechanism of racial control and African-Americans have been criminalized. So that's important. These are things that are actually highlighted also in uh, the film, The 13th. Let's shift over to mass incarceration for a moment. This is my area of expertise. 
I've studied corrections, you know, for the last 20 years or so. Uh, I've, I've studied people reentering society. I've, I've talked to hundreds of people getting out of prison and jail, and, and it's been a wonderful experience. But at current incarceration rates, about one in three black males, one in six Hispanics, and one in 17 white males are expected to go to prison during their lifetime. One in three black, one in six Hispanic, one in 17 white. There's that disproportionality again. African Americans uh, make up a large portion of our prison and jail population disproportionately compared to other groups based upon the population. From 1980 to 2019, the incarceration in jails and prisons, well, in jail, uh, prisons specifically, went from about 250,000 in 1980. So you had 250,000 people in 1980 that were in prison, state and federal prison. That number has increased to 2019, 1.4 million individuals are now incarcerated in the United States. We have the highest incarceration rate of any industrialized nation in the world. Now it's gone down by about 2% over the last couple of years. It's likely to go down even more with some of the release that's taking place due to COVID and a variety of other factors that are taking place in the United States right now. But we are um, a country that has uh, incarcerated people for the crimes that they've done. And some of them rightfully so. Some of those individuals need to be incarcerated um, and, and, and need to be there. Um, I won't go into punishment schemes, et cetera, just yet. I'll talk about the death penalty in a moment. But um, according to the US Bureau of Justice Statistics, something that we rely on all the time, in 2018, black males accounted for 34% of the total male population. White males were about 29%. Um, and you talk about female population, that's been increasing as well. Here's, the, here's a key factor to take into consideration for all of this. The late criminologist, Joan Petersilia, um, she was a great criminologist. I've, I've, I've worked with her in the past in terms of a variety of different uh, topics on reentry. But what she quoted um, not too long before her death was the fact that serving a prison term is becoming almost a normal experience in poor and minority, specifically African American communities. It's a normalized experience for folks. Going back to that, one in three black males, right, are are likely to. Um, go to prison in their lifetime. That's the likelihood, the probability of somebody winding up there, um, a variety of factors. Let's shift over to the death penalty. I'd like to talk about that too. Um, you know, as, as, a, as somebody that went to college down in Texas, um, I understand the death penalty a little bit differently than other people because when I used to go in and teach um, at six o'clock, uh, for my sociology classes at the Walls or Huntsville unit, I would go in the same entrance that people would be going in who were going to witness the death penalty that evening. If if an execution was going to be taking place, I would be walking in with people at the same time. I would go and teach up in the library and they would go off to the execution chamber. It's a very sombering experience. It was nice that I had to teach every inmate in there that I was teaching knew that an execution was taking place. Uh, it does something to the psyche. Uh, it really does, and you know that that's that's something you can't get out of your head very easily. But uh, the death penalty is alive and well in Texas, and it has been for a number of years. It's a it's a capital punishment state. Uh, it's one of the ones that uh, uh, has the most people on death row, um, and the death penalty has a long history. During slavery, for example, capital punishment served as a tool for controlling large black populations and discouraging rebellion. Lynchings were a key component by which um, there's a public message sent to African American communities that you live or die at the whim of the white community. Stepping out of the line puts you and your family and your community at risk. That's really what lynchings were about. And they were very public displays. And if you watch the 13th, you'll notice that there's a lot of imagery there that's used in that documentary about uh, how that image was used and, and what that imagery was um, was like in, in the South specifically, okay? And uh, all, although lynchings became rare in the mid 20th century, they didn't disappear completely because in 1995, uh, the lynching of, of Emmett Till for allegedly whistling at a white woman was a real pivotal moment for the civil rights movement uh, that spawned a reaction from African-American communities in the South to stand up and take action. 
uh, and 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 bled into uh, what we now know is is the the 1960s civil rights movement very very influential there. In terms of the death penalty itself, um, currently white and African American prisoners each compromise about 42 percent of those on death row, uh, and Latino prisoners make up about 13 percent. Um, what's interesting is that approximately 60% of the population is white. So there's that disproportionality of African Americans being placed on death row and sentenced to death disproportionately speaking when it comes to their, um, you know, uh, other counterparts. Most studies have found that race of the victim is likely to affect whether defendants are charged with capital murder or ultimately sentenced to death, especially when the defendant is African American and the victim is white. Uh, there's a disproportionate number of executions that have taken place whereby the victim was uh, was white and the person committing the offense was was African American. Um, again, of those currently on death row in the United States, 41% are African American, even though they only make up 13% of the overall population. Another interesting point that I found out as I was doing some research for tonight's um, discussion was that eight of the 10 states with the highest per capita incarceration rates are also in the top 10. Between, um, you know, incarceration and um, utilizing uh, executions. Chris, are you going to stop? Well, can you repeat that? Um, we sure. lost you there for just a little bit at the end. It's the top, okay. the top eight yep. top 10 states. Okay, yeah. eight of the top 10 states with the highest per capita incarceration rate are also the top 10 in their per capita execution rates. So there's a correlation there between incarceration rates and execution rates. So if you're in a state that has a high incarceration rate and the death penalty, you're likely to see both occurring at the same time. Um, one last bit of research that I found when I was doing some work tonight um, for tonight was that between 2013 and 2019, eight of the 10 major city police departments with the highest rates of killing civilians were in counties in the top 2% of death sentencing or executions. So what we're seeing is that those major police departments that are using violence um, or have, have used violence for whatever reason, or have had some use of force case um, where civilians were killed are also uh, the top 2% of death sentencing or execution. So you see that correlation there. And that's something we as sociologists and criminologists look at is that connectivity between macro level, um, macro on the system that's, you know, um, you know, creating these situations. Uh, and again, a lot of that goes back to what we talked about at the top of this was that the, the idea that there is a system that has been traditionally overtly discriminatory and subsequently that overtness uh, has now gone <laughs> we lost you again dale and the idea that the entire system and the entire group of people that are part of the system are not necessarily racist but they do have serious biases and serious prejudices against certain groups of people uh, and that can impact the processes uh, and the procedures that are used when and the of a system that time and time again is perceived as unfair and lacks legitimacy for so many because there's a lot of people questioning the legitimacy right now of law enforcement. There's calls for defunding of the police and that sort of thing. Um, and I've had many conversations with my colleagues, including Howard Henderson, who's been on. With law enforcement and what that means in terms of training, um, what that means in terms of connecting with other agencies, which you know, Professor Eldridge would, you know, um, highlight as well the need for, for social work to, to be a part of that more and more as, as, as things progress. Um, so there are things um, coming together and I'm, 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 we're likely to see change in some way, shape or form 
you know, moving forward in the 21st century. And I hope and pray for, for change. I, I pray for safety. Um, I pray for um, peace. And those are things that, that are continuously on my mind as, especially, you know, in Mercy Week and uh, every day when, you know, my wife leaves for work and we pray and we pray for safety of the people that she's encountering, uh, her colleagues, people that are protesting and, and that sort of thing. These are things that we need to keep in mind. Um, these are things that I keep in mind as um, someone of faith and, and, and that, that holds um, a lot of weight um, and it counterbalances some of the challenges that I, that I see as, a, um, as, a, as an academic. So thank you for your time and happy to take questions and field any kind of concerns or thoughts with regards to what we've discussed tonight. Good, thank you, Dale, appreciate it. So a question for you, Josh. Um, I know that, I don't know the length of time, but I know more so now, I don't know in how many years, the field of neuroscience, right? Measuring how our brain functions and operates in different kinds of scenarios. Has there been work in neuroscience relative to the, the concepts you're talking about? That our, does our brain, do parts of our brain function differently um, or can they be measured in different ways when we're talking about these ideas of like prejudice? Um, I think it's a little bit far afield for me, but I, what, I, what I'd say is yes and no. It partly depends on which of that sort of array, the complex set of sources is kind of operating. So, for example, so you can see, for example, when somebody's in a state of fear, right? When somebody perceives another person and they're in a state of, you know, sympathetic nervous system arousal, they're afraid of that person. Um, you can see that kind of thing in the brain. You can see, you know, the amygdala, for example, we know sort of processes fear um, quite well. So some things we can see almost in real time. Other things, we don't yet know how they work at the neural level. They're more complex. So some of the social factors, um, motivational things we can see in the brain to some extent. We know the parts of the brain that are involved in motivation. They tend to be a little bit more um, lower level in terms of you know involving limbic system and sort of mid-level structures. But the more complex social factors, when something social is activated, like you know the need to belong or the need to feel superior or a sort of complex categorization that's happened very quickly. Those things we can't really see yet at the neural level. So yes and no is what I'd say. Okay. Uh, and I have a question coming here by email. It could be either for Caitlin or Dale, either from the social work perspective or uh, criminal justice. Uh, what would be a basic first step in changing the culture in police departments against predominantly black populations what would be a step one could that one could act that could be put in place? Uh, where could they start? Mm. Professor Eldridge, do you want to feel that? I mean, I can feel that as well. But you you start, and then I maybe we see this differently. I would be curious to hear your answer. Well. Probably about 12 years ago, I served on a committee with the Westbrook Police Department um, that involved uh, understanding race relations in the city of, of Westbrook. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the city of Westbrook in Maine, uh, we've had a large influx of uh, refugees from a variety of places, Somalia, uh, Sudan, uh, Iraq, for example. So we've been getting to know our neighbors and we thought a committee would be a good way of, 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 of doing that. And, and that involved a number of, of law enforcement uh, professionals and conversations need to be had between law enforcement uh, professionals. Uh, and, it, it, and there's no one answer here. There's a, it's a combination of things that need to be done. A committee can only do so much. Uh, in addition to that, uh, conversations need to take place uh, with leadership, uh, with, with particular groups, uh, and hiring for diversity is, is, is a big one as well. I mean, that, that's an important part. Uh, we heard a variety of uh, research come out in the last, um, actually just last few weeks about how, I think it was in the New York Times, that uh, there are certain communities where law enforcement, um, law enforcement organizations actually reflect 
uh, the people that they serve. And then there are, you know, communities that are, you know, there's disproportionate number of white officers in communities that are, are very diverse. Uh, I will say being here in San Antonio for the last three months, I've noticed, uh, and I went and looked at looked at some of the data that there is a, a really great balance of diversity on the San Antonio Police Department. Uh, there's a high number of Hispanics in the San Antonio area. Uh, they make up a, a large portion of, of the city of San Antonio, and that's reflected in some of their hiring as well. So uh, there are a lot of officers that are um, that, that that look and understand uh, the culture. Uh, they and and they're able to um, you know to work with them in a more uh, significant way. So I think those are two things that can be done. Uh, yeah. So, Professor Eldridge, did you have something else? Yeah. I mean, I would just add um, there has to be collective buy in, right? Uh, I think the question, I think, was something, you know, where do we start with this? And I think a common sort of acknowledgement that there is a problem um, is a place to start and sort of letting everyone's guard down just a tiny little bit to say, like, yeah, we have some work to do on this issue. Um, so again, falling back on those human relationships, um, finding a way to acknowledge that something needs to be done is the first step, I would say. And then um, having some support, because we know that police departments, like many other public services, are often really crunched for funding and time and spread pretty thin. So to have some municipal support or structural support to say, yeah, maybe we can we can pay for a an implicit bias training, or we can pay to have a guest speaker come and, and talk about their experience, or we can you know take some time to allocate for officers to go through um, some different education or some training. So I, I I'm always a, in favor of hearing from. Um, people themselves, what they think would be helpful. Um, but first, I think you have to take the sort of micro baby step of agreeing that there's work to be done. And uh, if it's okay, I'll chime in also, since, you know, why not? Yeah. Um, but no, but there's an important point too from a psychological perspective that I just want to throw out there, which is we tend to think, you know, if you think about your attitude and your behavior, Attitudes we think of as like inside us and they control our behavior. That's the natural way to think about it. But the fact is that we know psychologically now that the arrow goes the other way too. Oftentimes people's attitudes shift as a result of doing things. So behavior affects your attitudes as well. And we know when it comes to things like race relations and prejudice, sometimes the best thing to do is not just try to change people's attitudes and then expect them to behave better, but you put people in situations that make them behave better. And that changes their attitudes little by little. So things like putting people in situations where they have common goals, where they're in closer contact with people who are different from them, um, those kinds of things can work inwards from the outside in. It doesn't always have to be from the inside out. It can be from the outside in also. And that's a very important theme um, to bear in mind, I think. Uh, you know, going off of that too, Josh, I mean, there's this notion of the contact hypothesis. The more you're in contact and engaging with people from diverse groups, uh, the more likely it is your attitude is going to shift with respect to how you feel about individuals. Uh, and that's sometimes difficult when in law enforcement, for example, or even in the correctional system, when you're dealing with people, oftentimes you're dealing with people uh, on their worst days. Um, so, you know, you don't get a lot, sometimes you don't, aren't able to hold on to uh, especially psychologically, you're not able to hold on to those good situations where you're able to help someone because the fact that you've had to deal with someone being aggressive towards you or being a threat towards you or being a threat to someone else, that overrides in your brain neurologically, that's going to override um, any kind of good feeling you had about what's, you know, what's taking place. There's just not enough stock <laughs> of those good experiences oftentimes to have a really good feeling and that can play a role in um, how people engage in their jobs. Um, I mean, we're blessed as academics to, um, you know, be in a situation where <laughs> we have pretty positive exchanges on a regular basis, such as this evening, but uh, 
any criminal justice professional will tell you uh, it's a stressful situation that they're in. Um, and, yeah. and that does something neurologically um, and can have a significant impact. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, not all contact is going to be good. I kind of mentioned it quickly, but but Dr. Brooker is totally right. It has to be the right kind of contact in order for it to change your attitude. You can't throw somebody into you know an awful situation and expect it to sort of magically affect them in the way that you want. But it, you can structure the contact in certain ways that we that we know, and that that can work its way inwards. So yeah, absolutely, yeah, I agree. And we have a comment here on the chat, which was uh, for you, Josh, which was. It says, what is the first step in moving from where we are um, to where we could be? Uh, this could be actually either for you behaviorally or psychologically, but it also could apply to you, Caitlin, as well, in terms of thinking about social work, right? <clears throat> um, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to build on what Dr. Elbert El El said about well, self-awareness. Maybe, frame it, maybe add a little frame to it, if I will. You mentioned uh, as well, Dr. Eldridge, that um, in terms of we need to take a step back in terms of self-assessment. You talked about social works. Um, part of social work is this reflective process. So does it offer a best practice or best practices that would be useful or helpful in this regard in thinking about how we get from, say, point A to point B? I wish. <laughs> I wish I could say, yeah, this is how we should do it. and. And and it, let's do it. Um, but I think um, again, it's sort of going back to you know we have a duty to our community um, as a profession and as you know as you know just in general we have we're pro social and we want to be connected and and we we sort of have this. Um, sense of human relationships and we, we crave connectedness where that's how we're wired. So I think um, part, I guess in my mind, part of how we get where we want to go from where we are, or where, we, where we get where we want to be from where we are now, which is not where we want to be, um, is to just focus on small steps and small relationships. And I know Oftentimes in social work courses, we talk about these big social problems like homelessness and poverty and hunger and um, you know lack of access to healthcare. And, and it feels overwhelming and we get swamped by it into this state of sort of like, uh, you know, we just call this, we have this sort of paralysis where we are overwhelmed and we're flooded and we can't think of what to do. And I think for me at least that has been happening um, a lot lately because the scope of some of these problems that we're dealing with in the world is just so huge that it feels like what difference is one person going to make or is my perspective going to make here but i think that's a dangerous path because that's indeed how every change gets made and i've said this a million times sam has probably been so tired of me saying that humans make these systems that we participate in you know, and humans can change those systems. So I think we have to have, again, relationships, collective will, and sort of a little bit more flexibility in our thinking, a, a willingness to sort of say, I don't necessarily have all the answers, but I, I can take the first step and connect with someone else and have a conversation with them. And, and I know that might sound cheesy or maybe even trite, but I, th I do really think that that is a step in the right direction to where we ultimately want to be, is just taking small actions on a consistent basis over the course of every day. Um, and I think those collective efforts ultimately do make big changes. Okay. And We're saying that if I can respond, does anyone else? <laughs> I'll just answer. I saw Dr. Ray um, is said, I'm looking for a mindset in the comments in the, in the first step. And I don't know if this is exactly what you mean, but from a psychological perspective, individual psychological perspective, I think what I would consider to be the first step, and maybe it is a mindset, is what Dr. Elwood mentioned before with his self-awareness. But I would take it a step further in terms of um, self-awareness with compassion. And what I mean by that is we have to um, help people understand what strength is and what strength isn't. 
And that can start at the personal individual level. You know, in our society right now, we have a problem where um, strength is often understood to be um, a certain kind of power, whether it's individually or socially, et cetera, et cetera. And one side of the political spectrum has sort of cornered the market on strong and what it means to be strong. And what we need to do to get where we need to go is to balance that out and say, wait a second, being strong can be something else. You don't have to be defensive to be strong. You don't have to be um, discriminatory or focused on status or authoritarian. Um, being strong can be something that emerges from self-awareness and from the kind of thing that, that we're talking about. So maybe that sounds a bit wishy-washy, but as a first step, I think that's something that's easy to focus on as as a first step, not the end, obviously, but as a first step. And Dr. I don't know if that's the kind of thing you were looking at, but that's what I thought of when you asked the question. Right. Good. Thanks. Um, Professor Brooker, I had a question for you, which had to do with you were mentioning kind of rates of uh, rates of shootings, of deaths, um, of the African American populations, other populations, and a comment that I see sometimes say on Facebook relative to this is people will say, uh, "Well, more whites are killed by the police than African Americans." But they're talking total numbers, right? So right. What are they missing when they're talking total numbers relative to what you were describing? Well, Dr. Schoenfeld and I teach statistics, and one of the things that they're missing is, you know, rates. Um, we're talking about rates. You know, how often something ha happens with respect to the population. You know, what what's happening, and that's really what they're they're missing. There's a number doesn't mean they're proportionate. So. Um, you know, really, that's what they're missing out on. Yes, more whites are in prison. Yes, more whites are um, killed by the police, but and more whites are executed. However, when you take a look at how much um, you know African Americans are in 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 the you know United States population, they make up thirteen percent of the total U.S. population, but they account for you know X percentage of those killed um, by officers or those being executed or that percentage. You know. Um, so it's a matter of the percent with regard to the population. So people miss out on that a lot. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lack of quantitative literacy oftentimes in our society. And, and that, that's, that's a challenge for us as, you know, academics, a lot of the times, you know, Josh and I have had long conversations about <laughs> getting our students up to date. Uh, and if there's a great book that, I, that exemplifies a lot of this, it's a book that I use. Uh, it's called Damn Lies and Statistics. It's by Joel Best, and, and that really highlights some of these issues. So uh, I would direct them to Joel Best uh, for uh, some literacy uh, on those issues. Great, thanks. Uh, yes, Sam, you have a question? Yeah. I'm trying to find the button, sorry. I have a question about that statistic though, because I think, I don't know if I just missed it or if it cut out technology, I don't know. But when you're talking about disproportionate, like amount of like the number of black people that are on death row was that disproportionate to total regardless of race on death row or like total population of our country you're up. uh i'm on mute uh so it meant to the entire population of of the country so in essence what we're saying is of those currently on death row people that are awaiting execution uh, Forty-one percent of those individuals are African American, but compare that with the fact that African Americans only make up thirteen percent of the overall population. Okay, that's crazy. That's nuts. Okay, well, thank you for clarifying. I mean, well, right. So all work. things, but all things being equal, right? Here's the thing: all things being equal. Chris, this goes to your point. All things being equal, if everything was equal in our society, and People were put on death row equally across the board. African Americans should account for thirteen percent, and they don't. They account for forty-one percent. That's a better way of saying it too. That explains it so well. But like, that's terrifying. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, any other questions for our panelists? Well, I asked each of you to commit to an hour, and we're now at 7.36. Um, so I want to thank 
each of our panelists, Professor Schoenfeld, Eldridge, and Brooker, thank you for making time for us this evening and for Mercy Week, and I think a fitting ending to Mercy Week to have this conversation uh, as a community uh, with our faculty. So um, I appreciate it. Thank you.